So we're going to talk a little bit about high power rocketry, what that is, how that relates to our club, as well as just anyone looking for a career in aerospace. And hopefully you guys will learn some stuff. You're welcome to um, speak up at any point if you have questions or you can send them in the chat. But yeah, hopefully you guys, you know, learn some new things and are somewhat entertained with your time in quarantine. Um, so we can go ahead and get started. And this is the first of a series of Zoom lectures that we're going to have. We'll have a couple different types. We'll have Zoom lectures introducing you to different rocketry topics. We'll have lectures speaking to ARA alumni. And then we'll have lectures just talking about current events in aerospace. Um, so just what we're going to talk about today is um, what is high power rocketry? Um, what are some different rocketry organizations? What certifications you can get and what that means? Um, and then we'll talk about the parts of a high power rocket, the motor, and then why you should build one and how to build one. So kind of go through all those parts and hopefully at the end of the day, you either feel motivated to build one or you are understanding why maybe you should. Um, so yeah, the main idea we want to answer is how you can build a high power rocket and how doing that can actually help you become a better engineer and prepare you more for the aerospace field. And again, like this can be kind of interactive. So if you have any questions, feel free to speak up. So what is a high power rocket? Um, some of you guys might have seen this kind of rocket before. This is an Estes rocket. So it's about, you know, a foot tall, maybe less. It's pretty small. It has the little parachute. Um, and these are fun to play with when you're a kid, but a high power rocket is essentially just a bigger version of that. So high power rockets can be anywhere from like five feet tall to like six, eight feet tall. They can be pretty big. I have some pictures later on to show you guys, but um, a high power rocket falls into these categories. So it's either an H motor or above, which I'll explain what that means. It has over 80 newtons of thrust, um, over 125 grams of repellent. You guys can read this yourself. It's not that exciting, but the idea is it is larger and more complex than your typical Estes rocket or model rocket. Um, and these are some examples of high power rockets launching. So for high power rocketry, there are two different large associations. There is NAR and there's Tripoli. So these are both pretty much the same thing. What they are is it's a group of adults who like high power rocketry who um, give out these things called certifications. So a certification essentially allows you to launch a rocket of a certain size. So there's three levels called level one, level two, and level three. Um, and as you go up in levels, you can launch larger rockets, more complex rockets, and you can you know gain more abilities. So once you get to a level two, you can actually launch your own propellants that you're pouring and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. Um, they're very similar, but there's a couple differences. Within NAR, the certifications never expire, whereas in Tripoli they do. In NAR, there are some rules that are a little bit more lenient. So the way that it normally works that you get a certification is you launch your rocket, and then if it comes back down and it's meeting all the requirements of having the right size motor and all that stuff, and it's basically like you could launch it again. So there's nothing wrong with it, nothing's broken, then you get that certification. And for L2, um, you also have to take a written test. but Essentially, NAR is a little bit more lenient, so you know they might let you get away with a little bit more. Um, and then Tripoli allows experimental motors. So there's a couple of key differences. Our team ARA tends to go um, with NAR, but you know they're they're both very similar. So the idea is both are very encouraging of rocketry experience, and certifications will often transfer. So you do want to look into this, but a lot of times if you have a level one in NAR, that can become a level one in Tripoli um, if you need to change around and stuff. And both of these have chapters all around the country. So for us, we normally go to some NAR chapters, which include. Um, HERA, which stands for Huntsville Area Rocketry Association, or SEERS, which stands for Southeast Alabama Rocketry Society. But all over the country, there are chapters of these. So you can find them if you're interested in launching. Um, you can look it up on their websites pretty easily. So just going a little bit more into these certifications. Um, level one, what you have to do is you have to build and launch a rocket with a H or I motor. So you might not know what that means yet. That's totally fine. We'll go into that a little bit more, but essentially um, the letter is the size of motor and larger letters are later in the alphabet, I guess, means a larger motor. So A is small, Z is big. That's pretty much all you need to know. So the benefits of being in level one is you can now 
buy and launch as many H and I motors as you want, both solid and hybrid. And then level two, you have to successfully build and launch a rocket containing J, K, or L, and you have to complete a written exam. Benefits, again, you can now purchase and use all those motors. And then level three is the highest level. You have to successfully build and launch a rocket, and you have to actually detail the entire process. So this is a little bit a little bit longer of a process. You have to have a mentor, you have to write down everything you did along the way, and you use either an M, N, or O, which are really, really big motors. That's about, um, like, for example, a couple years ago, we launched a rocket to 30,000 feet, and that was on an O motor. So they are really big. Any questions so far? Anything you guys want clarified here? And um, we have a couple level ones and level twos in the club. I'm a level two, um, which I can talk a little bit about. I got a question. Yeah. So are we required to have a certain uh, level of certification to be part of like a specific project on the club or? You are not. Really which um, level you? Yeah, you're not required. We do encourage that at least some people complete their certifications because at the end of the day, for us to launch these solids, um, most of the time you're gonna need a level two or a level three that's willing to actually press the button. So. If you guys build a rocket um, and it's going to like 10,000 feet, you're going to need um, a, a JK or L motor probably. So you're going to need someone who has a level two to officially press that button. So we, we really like to keep people with those certifications in the club because otherwise we can't be launching these motors. Now, not everyone has to do it and some people are more interested than others. Um, but yeah, and this is a good question. If the ability to purchase an H motor requires you to build it, how does that how does that work? So pretty much like if you say, this is my certification rocket, you can buy those motors. Um, but until you pass the certification, you can't just build and launch those willy nilly. So when you're doing a certification, they're gonna closely inspect your rocket, they're gonna make sure it's okay. Um, and you're not able to just build and launch them wherever and whenever you want. Um, you're gonna be under the eye of someone who already has that level one. Um, so once you've gotten that certification, you're able to now buy them from wherever and launch them, you know, wherever, as long as you're allowed to. Um, and it's a little more lenient, if that makes sense. But that is a good question. So when you're doing your certification, you tell them ahead of time. And often you actually buy the rockets at the launch site. So at our launch sites, there's typically a vendor selling those motors and you buy it, you say, I am going to get my certification. So yeah, that's a good question though. All right, moving on from that. Um, chat. Um, okay, so this is my certification rocket. So this is just an example of what you might expect a cert rocket to look like. So this was my level one, I called it all star. And then this is my level two, I called it Cran. Um, and it is the same rocket, I just repainted it. So there are some rockets that you can buy and actually reuse from level one to level two, which I've linked a couple of those later in the slideshow, but this is kind of the size that you're looking at. This is a pretty typical L1, L2 size, but I have a couple more around here for you to see. These are all people from ARA. So this is a smaller L1. This kind of L1 will probably um, go too fast and get ripped up in the air, but we have had one L1 of this size successfully make it. And then this is an L2 size rocket. This is what we call Franken rocket because it was the pieces of a bunch of different rockets put together. This is from last year and we used it for an avionics test. And then this is an L3. So L3s are massive. Um, this was uh, Carson's L3. He was the old president of this club. Um, and yeah, L3s are huge. I think this was an M or an N motor, but they are really, really big. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of all the size varieties that you can have. Typically, I would say you can expect about, for your L1 and L2, it should be about four or five feet tall. Um, so these are just the components of a high power rocket. And these are the same components you're gonna see in your rockets. If you're on the DMOS team, you'll see the same things. These are the same components in really a lot of different rockets. Everything's gonna need a lot of these parts. So we'll start with the propulsion system. So that's right here in the motor mount. Inside that motor mount, which is glued in the airframe, you're gonna have your solid motor, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then you have your recovery system and avionics. So your recovery is gonna be a, a string or a piece of uh, what's called shock cord tied between the two parts with a parachute. So whenever your rocket is ready to um, eject the parachute, it's gonna blow apart those two pieces and the parachute's gonna come out and then it'll come down to the ground hopefully fine. 
Um, so again, like this is something we'll go into more detail about later on, but those are both really important components of the rocket. And there's the coupler, which is what keeps together the two body tubes, and that's normally where it splits. Uh, in the coupler, you often have different flight electronics, so you might have um, an altimeter or something like that. It's up to you. You don't need to have those in your certification rockets, but it's always good practice. And then this is our structure. So pretty typical, you have your frame, you have your fins and your nose cone. Um, normally on these rockets, you can buy a kit and it usually has three or four fins. That's a pretty easy go-to. And then the nose cone. Um, and often you'll have to put some weight in your nose cone to make sure everything's balancing right. But you know, we'll, we can go into that later as well. Any questions about general layout of the rocket at all? All right, excellent. So now we'll talk a little bit about the motor. So this is a, like a sectional view of the motor. Um, so at the bottom we have the nozzle. So I'm not gonna teach you guys a lesson about propulsion. We're actually gonna have that next time, but essentially when the motor is burning, when the motor grains are burning, um, the gases go out the nozzle and that creates thrust. So that's the nozzle at the bottom. And when you buy a motor, um, typically it will come with all these components. And then we have the grain. So that's where the actual um, like gases come from when the grain burns. And it's normally in um, a shape like this, where it is um, basically like an O shape, but there's different shapes it can be. And then we have the end cap. So that's what's at the top, keeping everything together. And then we have the ejection charge. So this ejects the parachute. So this is a little bit of black powder that when your motor is burned out, it lights the ejection charge and creates pressure so that the two sides, the two parts of the rocket actually split. And that's what eject your parachute so that it recovers safely. Um, and this is not like stuff you need to memorize, but it's just kind of helpful to know when you get your motor, which sides goes at the bottom, which side goes at the top, and how it all works. And then these are the motor classes. So this will put into perspective a little bit more the sizes. So you start with A, or I guess micro, which is even smaller, and then you go all the way to O and beyond. Um, o is the highest you can go for any kind of collegiate rocketry, pretty much. That 40,960 Newton seconds is like a pretty hard limit there unless you get FAA approval. Um, but you'll notice as you go up levels, like A to B, the impulse doubles. So with every level you go up, it doubles. So essentially what that means is that two A motors will provide the same impulse as one B motor. And that helps you keep things in perspective as well. So yeah, just to put that in perspective, these are some like big um, commercial rockets compared to the scale. So if we wanna look at a Mercury Redstone rocket, that is what would be called a Z. And um, if we want to look at a Delta IV, that's what would be an AE. So that goes all the way through the alphabet and back. And we have Falcon 9, that's also an AE we have the space shuttle, which is an AG. So you can kind of see with this scale that it really continues up to rockets that we see launching commercially today, which is really, really cool. And so now we can go into why should you get a rocket certification? So this might seem like really kind of cool, but at the same time, you want to go into commercial rocketry. You don't really see why building a cardboard rocket would be that useful. Um, but it's definitely very useful. I recommend it. It provides you with hands-on learning. So you're actually putting it together. For me, this was one of the first hands-on projects that I did. So it was really helpful to me to actually understand where all the parts go and how they fit together because that really does scale up to your larger rockets. Like they still have fins, they still have a nose cone, they still have a motor. And you can see how everything fits together and really figure out how it works. Also, like I said, it improves your understanding of rocket structure and assembly. So when you actually put together a rocket, no matter how small or simple it is, it improves that understanding. So understanding how the parachute fits in and how it ejects when it's time is, is really helpful when you're building, like even these liquid rockets, like for the Ares team, that's still gonna have to have a parachute. It's still gonna have to have a nose cone. Like it's gonna have a lot of components very in common with this. Uh, it introduces you to concepts like center of gravity, stability, and recovery systems. So stability and center of gravity are kind of tied together, but basically what that means is that when the rocket's flying through the air, it remains stable. And that depends a lot on where the center of gravity and the center of mass are. So those are concepts that you can learn about more in aerodynamics, but essentially being able to build 
um, these certification rockets can help you understand that a lot earlier on. And again, recovery systems, that's really important. And if you're all worried about the propulsion and structures, it's really easy to forget that and forget how complicated it can be. Um, that's happened firsthand more than once where we kind of skipped out on doing great on the recovery systems and we didn't end up recovering a rocket. So that's really important. And you can start small with a certification rocket. And the ability to launch larger, more powerful rockets. So like I said, if we don't have an L2 or an L3 on the team, we're not going to be able to launch these larger rockets. So it's really important that we maintain that certification and we have people with those certifications as we go. Um, and even if you're just launching rockets for fun on your own, as you move through certifications, you can launch larger, more powerful, and more complex rockets. So you can get a little bit more creative um, and just see where it takes you. And finally, you can do it in your house during quarantine. I feel like that's the most important part. I know for me, I'm definitely missing being able to be in the lab or on campus as much and do stuff. So this is a really, really cool way to get some hands-on experience without having to leave your house. So we'll go into the actual parts that you might need, but I definitely recommend you guys try this out at home. Um, and if you ever need help, we can set up Zoom meetings and we can kind of go through where the different parts go. But ultimately, I really do recommend getting a rocket certification. Um, and there's launches happening pretty much every month that you, you could be able to go and launch it at. So yeah. Um, so if you're interested, here are some of the kits that will work for both your L1 and L2. So that way you can save money, you don't have to buy a second kit. The one that I had was the Super DX3, which is all the way on the right. But here's some other options. Um, I've seen people use all these kits, they're all really cool. The Little John is funny because it's maybe it's closer to like three or four feet tall, but it's still, all of them are really awesome and will work for both your L1 and L2, which can be great. And I also put in links here. So if you click those links, you, it'll take you directly to that. All these are right around $100. So that is something that you need to prepare for. They are a little bit expensive, but again, like you can launch it again and again, and it's a really cool hands-on experience. So I definitely do recommend it. Um, so tools. So to build this high power rocket, um, you'll need to use software. Can you build these on campus? You can typically, but right now we don't have as much lab access. So right now we're set up, um, once we get approved and the activity ban stops, we'll be able to have uh, 10 or less people in the lab. But we do need to get those activity days approved. So it is possible that we could do um, build days where we planned ahead um, and had you know eight to 10 people in the lab working. You'd have to be social distancing, wearing a mask, all that, of course. Um, but um, you should maybe, we can maybe work it out where we can have some build days on campus. Otherwise, um, you'll just build them in your house. Can you build them in the dorm? I don't see a problem with that. When you're using epoxy, you're going to want to make sure it's ventilated. So you might want to go out back. Um, same thing with spray paint, obviously, if you're going to be painting it. But otherwise, I don't think that would be a problem. Um, I can look into that though. And do you have to buy them yourselves? Yes, you do. But if you would like financial assistance, talk to me or Marissa and we can figure something out. Or I know a lot of people have left their certification rocket kits in the lab and we're doing a bit of a last call on those. So if some of those don't get claimed, um, you can let me know and claim one of those yourself. <laughs> So essentially the tools that you need, software, um, Open Rocket and RAS Arrow are both free tools so you can get on the internet. And those will basically help you um, put your rocket design in there. You can literally download the file straight from the internet from these rocket websites. And you can figure out how high it's gonna go if you put a certain motor in it. So that's a really cool tool. Um, they're pretty intuitive, but we also have tutorials coming up to teach you how to use those. And so those you can download free online. Hardware, um, you need epoxy to kind of keep everything glued and attached. You need popsicle sticks to spread that epoxy and cups to mix it in. Um, I recommend having cardboard or newspaper laid down just so you know you're not getting stuff everywhere. And then it is very helpful to have a scale to weigh the components and make sure that your model is accurate. Other than that, you don't need anything else. Um, you can have fiberglass or electronics or other stuff if you want to get fancy, but that's the bare minimum that you need. And we do have that stuff in the lab. So 
also, if you're interested in maybe like checking some of that stuff out, if you're working on it at home, just let me know and we can organize a time for you to pick up those materials. Other skills, patience. Um, you're gonna have to wait for stuff to dry. Don't rush it, it's not worth it. You want the fins to be straight, you want everything to look good. So just take your time when you're doing it, let the epoxy dry um, and you'll be all good. All right. So when and how can you launch your rocket? I went over this a bit earlier, but local launch sites. These are everywhere, all over the country. The ones near us are Sears, which is the Southeast Alabama Rocketry Society and HERA, which is the Huntsville Area Rocketry Association. So both of those are about three hours away um, and you can drive there. And I believe both of them have a launch limit of 10,000 feet. Um, so if you're not in the area, you can find your local Tripoli or NAR chapter and go launch there. But most of them are launching with COVID restrictions, which you need to make sure to follow. Right now, as far as official ARA trips, I don't think we're gonna be able to get many approved, but if you're interested in getting a group together and driving down, let me know. I can tell you uh, what you'll need to bring, what you need to make sure you do, and we can try to arrange some stuff in that way. And then, yeah, that's all I have. So do you guys have any questions about CERT rockets or how you can work on yours, why it's useful, anything like that at all? And again, you can put your email in the chat if you want a PDF copy. This will also go up on YouTube later. So all of that can be shared with you if you're interested.